Retina Part Two. Experimentally, one can map a receptive field by shining a light at different locations x1, x2, etc. of the visual field and observe the response O. This was what Kufler did for a retinal ganglion cell in a cat. The cat's residue fields are larger than those in a monkey. For example, when a light is on spot location A, this is the neuron's electric response as a function of time. Here, each spike is an action potential. So if the light is on location B, the spiking rate is higher. And the light on location C gives a spiking rate similar to light on location A and similarly on location D. So this is an uncentered neuron with the center location at location B. One can also map a receptive field by giving a disk of light or a ring of light centered on the receptive field. And this was done by Weasel in the late 1950s. When a small disk of light was at the center of the receptive field, this neuron fired a lot of action potentials. This marks the time when this disk was turned on, and this is when the disk was turned off more than half a second later. And the neuron spontaneously fired action potentials before the disk was turned on, so the disk increased the firing rate substantially. When a ring of light was centered on the receptive field with a dark spot at the center, the neuron's firing suddenly stopped and then recovered after the ring was turned off. A larger disk covering both the center and surround also increased the firing rate but not as much as when the disc was smaller in the first case. So this neuron also had an uncentered receptive field. Of an experiment study receptive fields using grating patterns, which are sinusoidal luminance patterns like this one. This grating should also excite the center surround receptive field to some degree, since a brighter stripe of this grating is at the excitatory center and some darker stripes overlap the inhibitory surround. Relative to this case, when we make the grating stripes a little wider, the neuron should be more excited, since the brighter and darker stripes coincide better with the on region and off region of the receptive field. However, if the stripes are too wide, the neuron is excited less. In this case, the brighter stripe overlaps with both the on region and the off region of the receptive field, so the excitation cancels the inhibition. If the stripes are too narrow, it is also ineffective to excite this neuron, and you can see why. We can describe each grating as uh, by such a sinusoidal function of spatial location x. This parameter k is for the spatial frequency of the grating. Each visual angle gives k over 2 pi cycles of the grating. So as the stripes become narrower, the frequency increases to give more grating cycles for a given spatial range. This s with this type of font marks the amplitude of the grating. It scales with the image contrast between the brightest and darkest parts of the grating. For example, this grating has a lower amplitude or a lower image contrast. But the other four gratings have the same high contrast. This phi is the uh, spatial phase of the grating, so if the spatial center of the rest of the field is at location x equal to zero, then all these four example gratings have their face angle phi equal to zero, since the peak or brightest parts of the gratings are at the center of the rest of the field. So if we plot the neural response output O as a function of the spatial frequency of the grating, we should see something like this. The peak response occurs 
at an optimal frequency of the grating. This is when the grating stripes are just wide enough so that roughly they are about the size of the center of the residue field. Now let's make it a bit more formal. The neural response O is this spatially weighted summation of the visual input Sx and the spatial weights are the residue field Kx. And this residue field Kx can be decomposed to summations of sine and cosine waves for various wave frequencies K. And the weights Gc for the cosine wave is this one. And this can be intuitively understood as a measure of how the residue field shape matches or resembles this particular cosine wave. For example, this match is small for this cosine wave because the wave frequency is too high and also a poor match when the frequency is too low, but a much better match here by matching particularly the central three stripes of the wave. Similarly, the weights Gs for this sine wave of frequency k is this one. Also a measure of how this kx matches this particular sine wave. This process of getting these values, Gc and Gs, as functions of frequency k is often called Fourier transform or Fourier analysis. We do not dig into finer details uh, definitions here. And uh, these Fourier Values often involve an additional scale constant C, depending on the definition. So we could use these proportional symbols here, but for our purpose, these details do not matter, so let's ignore them. If the residue field is an even function of space X, as it's the case in our examples here, then the weights for the sine waves are zero, since each sine wave is an odd function. For example, the match to a cosine wave, which is an even function, is good to give a good value for Gc, but the match to the sine wave, which is an uh, odd function, is zero to give zero Gs. So now Kx is only a weighted summation of cosine waves. So if we can measure these weights Gc, then we can construct the whole residue field Kx. And these weights can indeed be uh, obtained from neurons' responses to the gratings that we can measure because these weights Gc is proportional to the neural responses to the gratings. So this we can see by making it even simpler by ignoring these constants. And then indeed the neural response O scales with these weights Gc. Yeah. And uh, if we make uh, these contrasts SK constant across K and also make all the gratings aligned with the reset field by making the phase phi equal to zero, then the neural responses to the gratings give all our wanted weights GC and which, and these weights as a function of K is called the contrast sensitivity function of this neuron. Here is an example set of experimental data on the contrast sensitivity function of a retinal ganglion cell in cats. Here is a bit more digestion of this neural response result. The neural response O scales with the grating's contrast as it should be. The stronger the grating is, the stronger it can drive a neuron. Also scales with how this residue field shape matches this particular sinusoidal wave as shown in these examples. This factor is how the input grating is spatially aligned or in phase with the cosine wave. In all these examples, phase phi is zero. So cosine phi is equal to one. So all these gratings are at their best position to drive the neuron. Here is a particular example when this phase phi equal to zero. But if the grating shifts to a new phase of phi equal to 180 degrees, incomplete antiphase with the rest of the field, it should inhibit this neuron. In summary, by measuring the contrast sensitivity function through neurons' responses to perfectly aligned gratings, we can construct the spatial shape of the rest of the field, Kx,
as a weighted summation of cosine waves. So measuring the contrast sensitivity function GK and measuring the spatial shape directly, like what Steve Kufler did, are both effective to characterize the residual properties of a neuron. From one, you can get the other. This is governed by the approximately linear response property of neurons, and most retinal ganglion cells in primates and cats are indeed quite linear. This linear approximation also makes some mathematical treatments easier, as we will see later. Here, let's show a brief extension mathematically if you are interested in the general case when the reset field is not centered on x equals to zero, so it's not an even function of x. So in general, neither gc nor gs are zero. However, this could be written as a single cosine function with phase theta and with this magnitude. It is as if GC and GS are used for the two components of a two-dimensional vector that has this magnitude GK and phase theta. So this is as if the residual field is aligned with a grating with phase theta for this grating frequency k. We can use uh, complex variables for this understanding. Then we can have the Fourier transform using the complex sinusoidal waves. Then the neural responses following these simple derivations come to these three familiar factors. The contrast of the grating as before, the component of the rest of the field in the shape of a sinusoidal grating of this frequency, and the phase difference between the grating's phase, phi, and the rest of the field's phase, theta, in this frequency. Therefore, the grating can again excite the neuron best when the phase difference is zero to be aligned with the rest of the field. Therefore, measuring neural responses to various gratings can give us not only the magnitude, but also the phase theta. And we can plug it back to get the residual field shape kx. Or in reverse, once we know the shape kx, we can get gk through the Fourier transform, and thus also the contrast sensitivity function by its magnitude.